Uh, we're a bunch of really bright guys. If I can tame my computer, hold on. Shockley was the head of that research group. He was also an asshole. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, um, so uh, this thing right here is a piece of plastic. Um, this right here, uh, on both sides of this, there's a piece of gold foil. Um, and this thing right here is a crystal. It's a, it's a piece of germanium. Um, and this thing is called... Uh, this thing is called a point contact transistor. Um, and what it is, is uh, this piece of gold here, this piece of gold here, and this piece of gold here have a relationship such that they work sort of like that vacuum tube did. Meaning, you can apply a little wiggle to one side of this thing and get a big wiggle in voltage out of the other side of that thing. Um, I don't think that that conveys the grandeur uh, of this. But it's fundamentally, fundamentally important. This thing has no heater. You don't have to run a light bulb the entire time. It's solid state. It doesn't require a vacuum. There's no glass in it anywhere except for this thing, and don't worry about that thing. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and it proves that it is, yes, in fact, possible to make an amplifier out of sand, uh, which is super, super, super fundamentally important. Now, Bell Labs has this vested interest in doing this because they want to own the world of, of uh, they want to own the telephone world. Uh, they believe radio is really important to this, and they the transistor is really important to this. Um, Bell Labs is owned by at and uh, who are still around today. Um, and, uh, yeah, anyway, this is transistor. Um, this thing now, uh, this transistor turned, um, in 1947 they made that, uh, which like I said is called a point contact transistor. Um, what does it do? It's a, well, it does a lot of stuff. Uh, mostly what it does is, um, the reason why people care about it a lot is that it acts as an amplifier. Um, here. And that, when I was uh, giving my unsatisfactory explanation of um, of, uh, of this, right, I was like, wiggle in, bigger wiggle out. It does that, except it doesn't do it in a glass tube that's this big. Um, and that's sort of essentially what's important. Now, it also gets out a bunch of other stuff, because magic, this magic weird sand stuff, germanium, um, it turns out is actually also useful for tons of other stuff. You end up getting... Uh, you end up not only being able to use it to make an amplifier, you find that these, this esoteric effect that people had discovered back in the 19th century, which is if you shine a weird voltage on this stuff, or if you shine a light on this stuff, you get a voltage out, all of a sudden it becomes quantifiable and usable, and you get things like photo detectors from this. You get the ability to, like, like uh, I've already talked about Terminator, now I'm going to talk about Predator. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, like, when you see Predator vision, it lets you have Predator. Uh, so, uh, so not only can you get a sweet amplifier for your radio or your records, you can also get predator vision. And that's, that's, why, that's why the transistor is important. Uh, that image up there, um, the, uh, that little triangle you saw, uh, that was made, obviously, it looks real, real homemade, and that's because it was. Uh, and the bottom of that, um, there was one piece of gold and a, and a styrene triangle and the uh, bardeen, I think, uh, cut the bottom off with a, a razor, right? Like, the whole thing's made by hand. That, that gap there is 50 micrometers, which is about that thick. Um, so it's pretty thin. So that thing looks pretty big, and it is by transistor standards, but it's way smaller than a tube. Um, anyway, uh, 
One cool thing about Bell Labs is that they were like, this is a great scientific achievement. We're going to set this, this other team into trying to monetize this. And we're going to keep the alpha nerds over here working on ways to make this stuff a mess. Uh, <laughs> so the point contact transistor was actually not what they were trying to make. They were trying to make a thing called a, a, um, a field effect transistor, which didn't get made until a lot later. Um, but anyway, they kept working on that. They ended up making, from a point contract transistor, they made a thing called a bipolar junction transistor, which still gets used all the time. Uh, and then the rest of the sort of developments that came about had to do with making transistors better. Because until you couldn't, you couldn't make this thing a product until it didn't take a million people a million man hours to make one of these things. Uh, they already had, tubes that already had everything on lock at this point, and you could make a tube pretty fast. So for this technology to become it wasn't, we weren't at war anymore, so, so like money, no object wasn't the same as it used to be. So people were like, if it costs a jillion dollars, I don't want it in my TV. Um, like now. Uh, <clears throat> so a lot of the advances that happened had to do with making these things not only work better, but become physically smaller or more reproducible. Um, here is the schematic diagram for a bipolar junction. Also, if I'm talking for too long, I need to speed it up, but let me know. You have 20 minutes. Ooh, I can talk for 20 minutes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> all right, so this is a BJT. Um, uh, a bipolar junction transistor. There are, there are three parts of it schematically. Uh, the base, the collector, and the emitter. Um, they correspond to the gnarly pieces of wire which were on that earlier uh, overhead projector. But um, the you can take this thing and you can you can by applying different wiggles to different spots in it, you can get power gain, you can get voltage gain, uh, and there are a bunch of sort of intrinsic effects about this which limit its usefulness and which people fought with for a long time. Um, this thing at the time. Uh, at the time, that device, the one that was in that slide, was made, um, germanium was the material that people used to make stuff like this. Um, <clears throat> germanium is in group four of the periodic table. Uh, <laughs> if you have, um, I think it's a, where were they? Uh, group four, it's, it's four. the same, it's the same as, as carbon, as carbon. Uh, so you have a, I think it's what, like a, Carbon, germanium, silicon, is that right? Okay. Uh, so, uh, so at the time people used germanium, and mostly people used germanium because germanium was easy to melt um, relative to silicon, which is what people use all the time now. Um, it turned out, uh, is that a question? Or was it? Oh, okay. <laughs> um, <clears throat> all this transistor stuff. Uh, one fundamental difference. Uh, so, some fundamental differences between the BJT and the vacuum tube are, um, generally speaking, if we if we compare this to our triode, uh, which is that vacuum tube that I showed you guys earlier, uh, if you want to make an amplifier with this thing, you have. Uh, um, if you want to like, if you this is like the sort of amplifier that would be in like your guitar pedal or something. Um, we have a resistor here, a voltage here. Uh, this is like rocker dude with guitar here. So these things are these things are these little squiggles are resistors. This is our transistor. Um, this is our guitar. Uh, and what you have is this little signal that's coming out of a guitar here. Um, and it's causing a current to flow from this thing, the base, uh, to this thing, the emitter. As, um, as this small current flows, it allows a much larger current to flow from this thing, which is our 9-volt battery uh, in, our, in our rat pedal, to uh, ground here, which is the other side of our 9-volt battery in our rat pedal. Um, as this current flows through this device, uh, you generate, because, because of V equals IR, which we established earlier, you get a voltage that's across this. Um, as this voltage goes up, you draw more current. 
uh, and you see the voltage come down at that node. Um, as that voltage goes down, you draw less current and you see the voltage at this node go up. So you have an inverting amplifier. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if a rat is an inverting am amplifier, but it very well could be. Um, anyway, the point is you have a little wiggle that comes in here. You have a large wiggle, which is inverted, uh, which comes out here. Um, the BJT is distinct from the triode in that you need a current to flow. Uh, from the base to the emitter to get this to happen. Um, <clears throat> the current flowing, like, you want current to flow from here to here because that's how amplification works. You don't necessarily want current flow from the base to the emitter. Um, that's a, that, some people would see that as an unfortunate byproduct uh, of the way a BJT works. A lot of really brilliant people use that phenomenon to do a lot of really, really cool stuff. Um, but in this application, uh, you know, you might run your rats um, battery out faster, so <laughs> it's not good. Uh, and it's the same from the vacuum tube in that the vacuum tube drew no current at the grid. Um, and later advances in semiconductor technology allow you to, to get back to that world, uh, which allow you to make the computer, which is what I'm getting at with this. Um, eventually, you got to the point where you could, uh, all right, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about materials science now. Uh, I talked a little bit about why, um, what this does, and what this sort of schematic would look like. Um, and I'm worried that I've given the idea that, like, I'm sure that I've given the idea that you take a rock and you stick a wire on it and you get this thing to happen. Um, the transition from rock and wire to uh, actually applicable technology involves a ton of people figuring out how to make this stuff better, right? Um, you use, using germanium uh, to do this, basically, using germanium is what people did. We'll skip that and go right ahead to the... Uh, Silicon, which is what most semiconductors get made out of nowadays. The impetus for using silicon, um, the hard thing about using silicon versus germanium was that silicon melts at a higher melting point. Uh, it's harder to refine. Um, it has some advantageous qualities. Uh, a lot of them are thermal, and a lot of the motivation for using silicon had to do with the space program um, and with military people worrying about uh, temperature variation. What's the melting point? Uh, sorry? What's the melting point? Of silicon? Yeah. Uh, I think it's around 1400 degrees C, but I'm not sure. Um, anyway, so in order to do any of this stuff, you need really, really, really pure silicon and really, really, really pure germanium. It was figured out during Cat's Whisper days, during the days of those uh, of, of World War II when people were developing those weird spark plug things with the uh, with the wire inside, that you know half of them didn't work and half of them did. Uh, it was advantageous to try, and rather than using you know, whatever rocks, to try and make your own rocks. Uh, and people did this eventually. Uh, an industry to support the semiconductor industry came about, which was refining these crystals, um, which is really hard, uh, it turns out. So you start with sand, basically, or silica dust, and you melt it down. And now when you do that, you have like dirt and seashells and all kinds of other nasty stuff in there which are not good for semiconductors. Uh, and the process of taking molten sand, essentially, and getting, getting it so, so unbelievably so, so, so pure. Uh, so like, silicon for it to work, right, has to, uh, like you want purities which are approaching um, like parts per billion in silicon matter, right? Uh, like if you, if you had 100 milliliters of water, Right? and you put in one drop of red food coloring, one milliliter of red food coloring into that, right? And then you took, uh, you know, what is it? A million liters of water, <laughs> uh, you know, which is, I don't know, like an ocean, and dumped that in there, it would still not be pure enough, right? This room full of water, and then that room, and then the room next door full of water, and one red drop of food coloring would fuck it up to the point where you couldn't make a transistor with it, right? So that's like, that's the level of refining in material sciences that people needed to get to before they could do the sort of stuff that you want to do with transistors nowadays. Uh, once you have this particularly pure silicon 
to make this rat pedal, you uh, you then need to make it into, you know, you have this ingot or whatever, it's like rock, uh, and you need to make it into a shape where you can actually do something with it. And that's the next trick, which is um, making a, a monocrystalline structure. Uh, in order for all this stuff to work right, in addition to it being really pure, it has to be a really perfect crystal. Um, for these, uh, for the electrical properties of silicon to work right, um, a crystal a crystal is basically a way in which a bunch of atoms, uh, it's a natural way in which atoms like to organize themselves. Uh, usually it's a lattice shaped thing or a tetrahedron. If, um, if you guys have ever seen like Dungeons and Dragons dice, like a, like a four sided die, <laughs> yeah, a tetrahedron is, a, is an example of how silicon wants to organize itself. Um, having a crack in that or having like a crystal messed up in some way, it's very difficult, like that'll screw up the way your transistor or whatever active device you're trying to make works. So step A, refining this, this uh, silicon such that you can use it, um, and then step B is getting it to be a perfect crystal. And the way you typically get it to be a perfect crystal, the way you did back in, in these days, um, was you had this bath of molten pure silicon, and you had a rod, and on the end of that rod you had a seed crystal. Has anybody, how many people here have made rock candy? Right, rock candy. Yeah, it's the same kind of thing as making rock candy, right? Where you have the super saturated solution, and you put a string in it, uh, and you get a crystal out, sort of, except that it's really hot and dangerous. So uh, you have this rod that you put a seed crystal on the end of. You lower this rod into this bath of molten silicon, and you spin this rod, uh, and the seed crystal causes crystals around it, causes this molten silicon to set up in a crystal around it, and you end up getting this cylinder. Um, this rod spins, and you slowly pull it out of this bath, and you get uh, a cylinder-shaped piece of silicon out, uh, and it takes you know many, many hours. And then you have this relatively pure silicon sheet, uh, cylinder shaped piece of silicon and you cut it into slices and those slices are what you use to make all this stuff on it. Um, debating, debating talking about band gaps. Who wants to hear about, uh, go ahead. Ooh, that's, so that sounds awesome. It seems like this is, <laughs> I, I think so too. <laughs> it seems like there's this huge gap between like this pinnacle of purity of a particular kind of, uh, of material and like a rock that happens to get some results out of it. Was there an incremental improvement in like, did they, or, yes. or was there a, some kind of, okay. Yeah. So is it? <laughs> um, I mean, the incremental improvements were sort of the stuff that I, I skipped over those a little bit. Early on, it was truly just a piece of galena or pyrite or something that you stuck all on. Uh, the original cat's whiskers were like that. Uh, also because people didn't know that. And people still didn't know a lot of rocks uh, and crystals. And people didn't know about atoms particularly well at that point either. Mm -hmm. um, like quantum mechanics wasn't around. Uh, and quantum mechanics is totally... What's that? Still plum pudding. Still totally plum pudding. <laughs> uh, and quantum mechanics is totally important to the way all this stuff works. So um, you found, um, initially, a lot of that research, I think, had to do with trying to produce this stuff for the war, uh, where they were like, rock A doesn't work very well, rock B does work very well. Can we just make a rock that always works correctly? Um, and so initially, those, like the stuff in the cat's whisker was not really <laughs> pure. Uh, they made a relatively pure piece of silicon, and then they um, discovered that they needed to do a bunch of other stuff to it. Uh, and then incrementally over time, uh, silicon got better and better and better and better. Did you have a question? No. Okay, five. Oh, five minutes. Okay. <laughs> All right, so. Um, All right, so we'll skip some stuff. Uh, and say that tubes did great until about the 60s, right? BJTs are still around today. They still get used for tons of stuff. They have some principles which are really great for electronics. They have a lot of gain, 
Uh, like if you're trying to make a low noise amplifier or some esoteric weird piece of analog electronics, you might still use a BJT like the one that's similar to that Skynet looking thing that was on the screen earlier. But uh, another huge revolution came about um, in, I want to say, the 60s. <laughs> uh, in 59, uh, what we're doing for Dame and Chocolate we're trying to do initially was make this thing called a MOSFET. Uh, and a MOSFET is basically this idea that you can take um, uh, a MOSFET schematically looks like this, and the idea is that you can vary an electric field on a plate here, and you can affect a piece of silicon such that current does or does oops, uh, does or does not flow through these contacts. It's like a BJT, except that it draws no quiescent current, which means that the thing is on, great, it's on, uh, it has no resistance, no power is lost, it's off, great, no power is lost, and what this allows you to do is make a perfect switch. Uh, the perfect switch allows you to design digital electronics. Digital electronics allow you to make digital ICs, digital ICs allow you to make microprocessors, microprocessors allow you to make computers, computers allow you to make the internet, and here we are today. consumes no power. What that means is you can put millions of them, really, like the processor on even this shitty ancient phone uh, has millions and millions of these transistors on it, right? Most of the time those transistors are in a state or another state. When they are in one of those two states, they draw no power, essentially. Uh, and when they draw no power, they generate no heat. The fact that they generate no heat uh, means that it doesn't burn your pocket up, uh, and it allows you to run that sort of thing on the battery. So that's, that's the real thing about the perfect switch, yes. Um, so how small do they get, the smallest one? So, uh, really small. Uh, have you, uh, has everybody heard of Moore's Law? Does anyone know about that? Um, Moore's Law is this thing that this guy named Gordon Moore came up with in 65, and it, what, it, uh, what it was was this prediction that every year you'd be able to fit twice as many transistors on a chip as you could the year before. Now, keep in mind, uh, 47 is when that gnarly piece of glass came out, right? It's only 70 years later. Uh, and we went from, like, you know, ENIAC, like computers that were the size of this room, to the computers that we have nowadays. So it's a, it's, it's a fairly rapid advance. And uh, it's gone to the point, the reason I mentioned Moore's Law is because it was basically true, and it's basically been true until People are starting now to be like, is it actually right? And the reason they're starting to, Moore's Law is starting to come into question is because you're getting to device geometries for these things, which are where, you're starting to get to a point where channels and whatnot are an atom wide, right? There's no way with, with physics being what it is to make this any smaller. So you have a lot of research that's going on now into, into like if you guys have heard about quantum computing, uh, it's what people, it's, it's a field that people are really geeked about now because it allows you to use fundamentally different behaviors of transistors to try and get uh, devices to move more quickly or hold more information than you can with this sort of technology because you can't make them any smaller. And would there be any advantage to keeping a larger size? Yes, uh, there are tons of advantages in that. Um, Packing lots of transistors into a small area is useful for a computer. Um, for making something like an amplifier, uh, the bigger those things are, the more power they can handle. So um, in any sort of like power amp, which you find in a radio or a stereo, uh, you have big transistors. Uh, you also get low noise. A lot of the like big transistor um, usefulnesses uh, have to do with analog electronics. Um, generally, for, for a computer-style transistor, you want them to be small. You can have more memory in a space, you can have more processing power in a space. 
Any more questions? Um, someone argued that tube amplifiers <laughs> sound better. Can you say anything on why there's a difference in sound without even necessarily making a judgment? Why is there a difference in sound between like, something that's powered by tubes and something that's powered by um, semiconductor? I can. <laughs> um, I would say a lot of it has to do with the fact that people are the things that listen to music and make those sorts of judgment calls. Um, there has been some, I think personally, that if you write a great computer program, you can make it sound awesome. Uh, and that a great listener will have a hard time telling you it's being hit in a tube, but that's because I'm a heretic about that sort of thing. Um, you get slightly, with certain circuits, you get slightly different distortion artifacts. Uh, and so it's possible that, and your ear is incredibly sensitive, so different distortion artifacts from different types of amplifiers are noticeable to the ear in a way that would be difficult to detect in the oscilloscope. That's your usual argument for why tubes can sound better, uh, as you have different harmonic characteristics of distortion. Go ahead. Uh, um, are, <laughs> are, um, are silicon and or germanium way better than things near them on the periodic table? That is sorts of things, or are they just more common? Uh, well, what they are is intrinsic semiconductors, right? You can, uh, silicon and geranium, you can make a pure crystal, well, semiconductors aren't generally pure crystals. Uh, usually, if, if I hadn't skipped that part of the lecture, uh, to get a really good semiconductor, you have, you do a thing called doping, which is where you take uh, a bicycle, which is where you take uh, <laughs> this pure silicon crystal and you introduce impurities into it in a tightly controlled way. Um, it gives it more, uh, it gives it an excess of free electrons or an excess of free holes, absence of electrons. Um, and you call it P doping or N doping, whether you want the, that particular crystal to have more free electrons or more free holes. Um, do your thing called a band gap uh, as a result of that, which is a difference in energy states between electrons, right? Uh, well, like skipping a lot of quantum mechanics, you, uh, electrons, what's that? P versus S versus orbitals? Or? Uh, you get, you, in, in semiconductor physics, you talk about conduction bands. You talk about a valence band and uh, a valence band and a conduction band. An atom that's in this crystal has energy levels that it likes to be at and a forbidden area where it isn't. Um, and one of the ways, one of the reasons why you would ever use something besides silicon or germanium is because it affects those energies, which affects what the crystal can do. So, for instance, I brought up predator vision. Uh, predator vision is a special case. You can't actually get predator vision from a silicon crystal. You use uh, like an indium arsenide crystal or something like that um, to get predator vision. Uh, and that's made, instead of from group four, uh, you talk about, semiconductor people talk about three, five semiconductors, which is like gallium arsenide or something, uh, which is instead of having all four atoms in the, or four electrons in the outside band, you have uh, a crystal that's made of something with three electrons in the outside band and five in the outside band, or two, six semiconductors. But yeah, there are, silicon is the easiest to use for us now, it does a lot of stuff great. But you get specialized semiconductors for other stuff. Uh, what's the most popular use of the crystal now in the devices? Uh, I mean, I'm gonna say that probably most of the sales are in, in computers and microcontrollers. So processors, probably. Memory. It's, it's still using crystals? It's still using silicon, and silicon is still a crystal. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. And kind of silicon's made out of sand, is it sustainable? Um, I don't think anyone thinks about it that way, uh, because there's so damn much sand, uh, and you don't use hardly any of it. Uh, like, making one of these things, you know, which is like, you know, this incredibly expensive big thing is this big. Uh, and you don't use a ton of sand to do that. So I don't know, it probably, I suspect we will run out of other things before we run out of sand. Uh, go ahead. Um, could you explain what the fuck capacitance and ceramics and or are those semiconductors if not existing on this phosphate? Capacitance. Uh, capacitance is, a, is an electrical principle like voltage or uh, current or resistance. And it's the ability for, um, for two parallel plates to store a charge. Uh, 
you get a purpose in capacitors a lot, and you get it in a lot of other stuff on accident. Right, like this amplifier right here, as I've shown it, has, uh, has a parasitic capacitor here uh, called a Miller capacitor, which limits the frequency of operation of this thing. Uh, it's related to semiconductors and all electronic things everywhere. Um, but it's basically, when you have two things that are close to each other, you get charge flowing across those things. That's essentially what capacitance is. Go ahead. I apologize for this earlier, but is there still a practical use for germanium that's like mass uh, produced? And are there other groups, group members of group four that are used in uh, specialized applications? Yeah. Uh, germanium, I don't know if germanium gets used. It probably does get used for something. I don't know what it is anymore. It has um, a, a smaller band gap, uh, which makes it less thermally stable, but it might get used for something. You find diamond gets used for really specific things, uh, which is carbon. Um, and I think that gets used for real esoteric power semiconductors. Uh, but yeah, you find things in that column. You find everything from around there. Like there's tons of research that once people figure out silicon, they're like, wait, we can make semiconductors from all this stuff. So like a lot of like, like physical chemistry PhD students go into the lab <coughs> and like sweat away making some esoteric semiconductor, hoping it's useful for something. <laughs> Go ahead. I heard uh, the prism program is actually based off an actual prism that splits the signal from the undersea cables. No, but I would yeah. believe it. I mean, you can model a lot of stuff in software. someone in the audience who you can make out with tonight. Oh, also remember, don't go through this door. Don't do it. You can bring your, you can bring your beers around to the outside one night only. Don't go through here. Ten minutes. We'll see you back here in ten minutes. For Lexi Mountain and Lobsters. Don't go back. Don't, it's, it's not mine. Don't go there. 